Welcome to Reconquest on the Crusade Premium Channel, part of the Veritas Radio Network. This is Brother Andre Marie coming to you from St. Benedict Center in Richmond, New Hampshire. Our websites are catholicism.org and reconquest.net. My email address, should you like to shoot me a quick email with a suggestion, question, or comment, is bam at catholicism.org. That's bam at catholicism.org. You can reach me on social media as well. I'm on Twitter at brother underscore Andre, and you can find me also on Facebook. Just search for Brother Andre Marie, and you will find me. This evening's show is episode number 236, and I'm calling it The Genius and Timeliness of the Traditional Latin Mass. And my guest is Dr. Peter Krasniewski, who is who has joined me before, and I'm privileged once more, I think this is the fourth time, to interview him. I said, I'm calling the show The Genius and Timeliness of the Traditional Latin Mass. Well, it just so happens that I stole that from the good doctor because he's just published a book um, through the publishing house... Um, Angelico Press, and it's called Reclaiming Our Roman Catholic Birthright. The subtitle is The Genius and Timeliness of the Traditional Latin Mass. So I don't think that Dr. Krasniewski needs any introduction to this audience, so I will bring him on with no further ado. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening, Brother. Thank you once more for, for joining us. I really appreciate it. Yes, it's a pleasure every time. Good, good. Well, that's good to know. Um, so the first thing I noticed about this book uh, was, aside from the fact that it's got a really nice cover, I thought the cover actually captures a lot of the spirit of the traditional Latin Mass it, 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 as a movement, right? Not not as a liturgy, but as a, as a movement. It's got a, a good picture of a young father, a young dad, holding uh, what appears to be a, a, a two, two-ish year old uh, son, and they're facing towards uh, the mass, uh, th- towards the altar, and the, the the picture of them is from behind, although you sort of see the, the dad's face in profile, because uh, he's turning towards his child as if pointing him towards the sacred mysteries on the altar. Now, we don't judge books by their covers, but this was a good cover. Um, <laughs> now, <laughs> Yes, Angelica books always have good covers. <laughs> so after that, the the next thing that, 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 that caught my eye were the names of some of the people who recommended the book. You know, at the beginning of the book, the, fir- the first couple of pages there are these plugs for the book. Um, some of the names didn't surprise me. Father John Perricone, uh, a, a kind of a known quantity in the traditional movement, uh, especially up here in the Northeast for years. Uh, Father William Slattery, uh, who's who's uh, written a, a book that's been plugged a lot on the Veritas Radio Network, and that would be Heroism and Genius, How Catholic Priests Helped to Build and Can Help Rebuild Western Civilization. Dr. Michael Foley, who, who uh, has written some really interesting books, um, including one that I haven't read, Drinking with Your Patron Saints, uh, I, I like the name, uh, and The Politically Incorrect Guide to Christianity. Now, but some of the names that surprised me were Dr. Janet Smith. Myth. Um, I didn't know she could be counted as a, as a trad, so to speak. Um, she's a, a, a moral theologian. Also, Leela Lawler, Leela Marie Lawler. Now, I, I don't, I, I don't think she's anti-trad or anything, but she's she's the wife of um, Phil Lawler, the the well-known Catholic journalist, and she's a, a writer in her own right. Um, that kind of surprised me a little bit, although I know she's trad friendly. Um, Jesse Romero. Uh, is on this list, lay Catholic evangelist, um, and also a bishop, Bishop Archbishop Thomas E. Uh, Gullickson, am I pronouncing his name right? Yes, that's on. Who's an apostolic nuncio uh, to Switzerland and Liechtenstein. So, um, you know, I realize it's not, it's not going to be the burden of what we're talking about, but um, how did all these recommendations come? I mean, did, did you send these manuscripts out or, to them, or did, other, uh, did the publisher? Yes, well, so I have to just say that the conception the conception of this book explains why I chose these people. Um, I've been wanting for years to write something that is directed to a broader audience, um, an audience of people who are, let's say, not already traditionalists. They're not already squarely in the movement. Uh, maybe they're curious. Maybe they're watching on the sidelines, intrigued, perplexed. 
um, maybe even a bit annoyed, but they, they recognize <laughs> that, that that it's a serious movement, something's yeah. happening. Um, and so I, I wanted a book that could actually really engage a wide, wide audience of people. Um, and that's why this book is more apologetic than any of my okay. other books. I mean, all of my books have an element of, of apologia, of, of defending and arguing for traditional Catholic practices, uh, especially in the liturgy. But this one is... You know, very much in the vein of like Protestant turned Catholic is now going to give you apologetic arguments for why you should be a, a, a Catholic as well. I see. This is, you know, uh, Novus Ordo Catholic turned traditional Catholic giving people arguments about why they should also cling to the tradition of the church um, it, it, and find in it, uh, a, you know, a treasure that they won't find elsewhere. So, with that in mind, um, I did ask a few people like Dr. Foley and, and Father uh, Father Pericone, you know, who are well known, as you mentioned, in the traditional movement. But I also wanted, I, I definitely wanted to have a bishop, um, and I knew several bishops who would be interested in doing this. But I wanted somebody who wasn't, let's say, a household name, uh, you know, like the yeah. few bishops who keep showing up all the time. <laughs> yes, yes, I get it. I get it. Yeah. Um, and and so that's why I asked Archbishop Gulikson, who's who's very tradition tradition friendly, um, and Dr. Janet Smith. Um, you know, she's become in recent, uh, I would say in just the past year, she's become really outspokenly um, supportive of, of the Latin Mass. Uh, it's something that she has rediscovered and has really fallen in love with. Um, and so that was, you know, she was a kind of natural choice for me in that sense. And Lila Lawler, um, you know, she too just really appreciates the richness of Catholic tradition, I, I, and she appreciates it more and more. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, Jesse Romero, same thing. If you if you read his endorsement, he basically says, "I had no idea that yeah, yeah. anything like this existed until you know until I, I discovered it, until I stumbled upon it, and you know now that my eyes are open to it, um, I you know he basically says uh, you know that he grieves that there are so many Catholics who don't know this yeah. and who may never know it." Yeah, yeah, and and he's uh, he's very humble in what he says. I was impressed at his uh, at his uh, sort of self effacement as he in, in in what he wrote plugging the book. Um, okay, so that's that's good to know. Now, as far as the the actual content of the book, as any of your books are, it's it's deep, it's 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 rich, it's packed. Um, and of course, we can hardly give a, a, a sufficient overview of the entire thing. So I'm just sort of um, uh, picking and choosing things that I'd like to 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 ask you about. The one of the first things that I encountered in my uh, quick reading was the. So you you talk about in, in chapter two, which I think is kind of an overture to uh, a lot of the themes that are going to be touched on in the rest of the book. Um, you say that the you, you you ask the question, what is the mass? I mean, before we get into questions of the traditional mass as as distinguished from the Novus Ordo and how one uh, assists at the one versus at the other, and how we just sort of conceptualize the mass, the first question is, what is the mass? And you make the statement, which I think I don't think it will surprise most of our listeners, but maybe some um, who could be new uh, too. Um, and if that's the case, that's okay, because uh, this is like a dialogue with, with people who aren't yet in the movement, which I think is what your book is supposed to be. Um, so you make the point that the Mass is not a reenactment of the Last Supper, which that's because that's a Protestant conceptualization of Christian worship. Uh, rather, it is an actual offering of, of a sacrificial victim. Um, but, however, and you, you also say that that Protestant conceptualization of Christian worship has entered into the church. Uh, now, you don't explicitly say it from what I can remember, but uh, I think that a lot of this is because of the institution of the Nova Soto and certainly the way that it is, is practiced. Could you comment on that? Yeah, certainly. Um, I mean, what, what, what I what I bring what I try to bring out very clearly is that <clears throat> it's possible for a sacrifice uh, of a victim to be a meal as well, but it's not normally the case that a meal would also be a sacrifice. That is, it, it, it's very important where you start, how you start thinking about something, and 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 what really it is, essentially. Um, so if you look at all the Old Testament sacrifices, right, in many cases. In all the cases, the victims are offered, and in, in, in many cases, then the priest and even the offerers, uh, the, the non-priests, are, are able to eat 
the victim. And that's the kind of sacrifice that the Holy Mass is. It's the offering of Jesus Christ in his body, blood, soul, and divinity, um, a renewal, a representation of the sacrifice of Calvary on the cross, um, the, the one act of atonement that saves the human race. It's, it's an offering of that sacrifice in a mystical and sacramental way. And then the priest and the people who are disposed for it to, can go up and receive of that victim and unite themselves to that sacrifice in which our salvation consists. So, and really this is a profoundly um, Pauline conception. This, this goes right in line with St. Paul, who, and also with the letter to the Hebrews, which some have attributed to St. Paul, you know, that the sacrifice of Christ is the pivotal reality. We, when we unite ourselves and become one with him in that sacrifice of charity, which we're very much thinking about today on the Feast of the Sacred Heart. That's right, right that's right. Um, then, then we ourselves become a pleasing offering to God. And the, in a sense, the whole purpose of the Christian life as we read in Letters to the Romans, is to make of our bodies and, of course, of our souls pleasing offerings to God. We can't do that without Christ. We can't do it apart from Him. We have to do it together with Him. And the Mass is the masterpiece of God's wisdom and love by which He enables us to unite ourselves most intimately with that sacrifice. Um, and obviously, the Mass isn't the only way we do that. We do that in any work of charity, corporal or, or spiritual. We do it with other sacraments as well. But the whole... The, the whole solar system of Catholic of the Catholic life revolves around the sun of the Eucharist and the Mass. I mean, if we want to take a heliocentric uh, metaphor here. Right? <laughs> um, so ev everything, you know, is rotating around this axis. Uh, and what I, what I try to get at in Chapter 2, which I agree, I mean, Chapter 1 is a, is, is a sort of pr prelude in a way because it talks about 10 reasons why it's great to go to the, the traditional Mass. But Chapter 2 is... I would describe it as like the meatiest chapter in this new book, because what I'm really trying to show is how all the the most distinctive aspects of the traditional Latin mass um, either flow from or support that fundamental truth and reality and mystery, you know, that, that we've been talking about. I thought it was a deft handling of the of the sacrifice meal uh you know aspects the, the sacrificial and the um meal aspect of the mass i can remember b being involved in some very um blockheaded conversations about this in the early 90s uh when i was sort of c coming into the traditional movement more and more and uh i can remember some people saying uh, you know, objecting that, you know, the Mass is a meal. And then you had some people saying, no, it's not a meal. And I thought, well, wait a minute, how can you say it's not a meal? Even St. Thomas wrote the Osacrum Convivium, you know, yeah. O Sacred Banquet. So, yeah, exactly. yet the yeah. Sacred Banquet, it, and a, a friend said, um, you know, at the time, I guess Chunky Soup commercials were popular, and they, they used to advertise Chunky <laughs> Soups as the soup that eats like a meal. So a friend of mine said, well, it's a sacrifice that eats like a meal. Um, I mean, he, he was being comical, but the idea was that, that, that it's the sacrifice first, and then from that, we get the victim that, that we partake of. But right. if you think of it as a meal, as, as you point out, it, it's not normal to have a sacrifice in a meal, you know? Yes. Yeah, and, and, and so for, just to give some examples of, of what I can draw forth from, from that central point, that axis, um, I talk about what I call the sonic iconostasis. Yeah, I uh, definitely so want to this, ask you about that. This, this, so this sounds like a, like a really technical kind of term, but what I mean by it is, okay, an iconostasis is in a, in a Byzantine or Greek Catholic church or a Greek Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox church, if you go and you see a large icon screen or iconostasis in between the sanctuary where the sacrifice is offered and the nave where the people are standing. Um, and it's covered with icons of saints, of our Lord, of Our Lady. Um, it's venerated throughout the liturgy. Incense is, is burned before it and people, you know, chant towards it. But it's a barrier. So it's a barrier that both that both separates us from what's happening inside the sanctuary and draws us almost magnetically towards that, right? It's like a charged barrier that that draws us into the mystery of what's happening precisely by telling us very loud and clear, it is a mystery. This is not an ordinary meal. This is not any kind of ordinary human earthly event. This is a participation in the worship of the heavenly Jerusalem. So the East has its own way of doing that. Um, the West, however, has its proper ways of doing that as well. We do it through more through uh, what I call the sonic 
iconostasis. That is something you hear. You hear Latin, you hear Gregorian chant, and you hear, if I can put it that way, silence. Mm -hmm. And because all three of those things are distinctively sacred, right? When you hear the Gregorian chant, you know it's music. It's unusual. It's unearthly music. It's it's not like any other kind of music that we have in the secular world. It's music for divine worship. When you are confronted with the kind of saturated silence that you get in the traditional mass, when you're confronted with an archaic, dead language, like a language that is so old and so venerable and has been prayed by so many countless thousands of Christians, you know, when you have that kind of language, it immediately says to you, we are in uh, a divine special place, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, in fact, the, the, the very fact that we can't immediately understand the Latin or what the chant might be saying or the silence, even if a priest is saying something silently, you can't, that's good for us. That's humbling. That puts us in a spirit of reverence, a spirit of acknowledging that, you know, I have to bow my head before this transcendent, ineffable mystery that I will never wrap my, my head around. And yes, I can, with, with patience and with practice, I will understand more and more of what's being said, of what the chants are talking about. I can use my daily missile. I can follow along. But it sends that, that kind of formidable initial signal that this is not being done for you. It's being done for God and towards God, right? Mm -hmm. So I see it as as a huge benefit to be thrust right away into our proper stance as creatures towards the Creator. And that's what I think the Eastern and Western liturgical rites do that in different ways, right? Yeah. So I talk about some of the ways yeah. the Church of Mass does that. Yeah, the Byzantine rite so much more um, gre gregarious, um, bombastic even, if you will, in its <laughs> expression, and it doesn't have anything like the silent canon. Yes. Yet they have these other ways of saying, okay, here's a zone that you don't go into, yes. and here's something that you don't even look at. And that goes back to something in, you know, a, a truth of the Old Testament with the, the different zones of the, of the temple, and, you know, I, the, the, those who weren't priests couldn't go into the court of the priests, and those who weren't the high priests couldn't go into the exactly. Holy of Holies. Yeah, and, and we, see that, we see that with Zechariah, too, in the Gospel, right? He goes to burn incense in the Holy of Holies, right. and nobody sees him, and they're wondering what's taking him so long. You know? exactly. <laughs> they're all waiting out there for... Um, yeah, let me just... Po I just want to make a point about this. I have... You know from reading my work that I, I have a, a deep love and fascination with the Eastern tradition as well, or all the Eastern traditions. There are many Eastern yes, traditions. Yes. Um, I'm a, you know, I'm a traditional Latin mass man to the core. You know, I love going to Byzantine liturgy, but I would never make it my home. My home is very much with the Western. So, so Constantinople is a nice place to visit, but you wouldn't want to live there? Exactly. That's right. Well, I don't know how many people would actually want to live there nowadays. But <laughs> yeah. So, um, but, but the thing about the, what I see all the time on social media is so much misunderstanding between East and West. It's yeah. just, it's, it's such a sad thing that people, they, they tend to, to, to glomp on to the superficial differences between East and West, or for that matter, superficial likenesses. And then they make false arguments. So, for instance, you'll you'll see people saying, "Oh, well, you know, in the Eastern liturgies, so often we're chanting, everybody's singing, all the people are singing in their own vernacular language. Isn't that wonderful? You know, what's the problem with this this Latin Mass um, c community that where people are? There's a lot of silence, and and the choir is singing the Gregorian chant. You know, that's just it shouldn't be that way. Well, what I say is, look, <laughs> the the Eastern and Western liturgies, they work very differently. In the East, it works by an excessive amount of verbiage. There's so much prayer, so much singing, that if it wasn't, at least often, in the vernacular, the, the people would be totally drowning in unintelligible verbiage, right? So, that, that is, it's because it's so heavily verbal, it has to be extroverted and it has to be accessible in a way that the Western liturgy doesn't have to be because the Western liturgy works more by what I like to call concentrated solemnity, right? It works by by a kind of choreography of largely silent movements that point to the sacred, um, almost like a sacred theater, you know? It, it, it works by sort of poignant, repeated prayers that you get used to over time that are much shorter, that are much more compact. Um, so the whole thing is it's actually um, 
it's more finite. You know, the, the Roman right, if you were to write it down in a book, right, it takes up, you know, a tenth of the number of pages as, as the Byzantine liturgy does. Mm-hmm. So even when you think about differences like that, it's immediately going to translate into ceremonial and ritual ways in which the Western liturgy creates the same aura of sacredness and mystery that the Eastern liturgy creates in a different manner. And if the Western liturgy is done like the Eastern liturgy, it's going to flop. It's not yeah. going to work. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I remember uh, Dom Guéranger was talking about the Jesuits, and he said, he said, and of course he was a Benedictine monk, and he said, what makes the Jesuits great would ruin us, meaning Benedictines. Um, yes. And because the two totally, they, they have to be uh, considered each in their own right, you know, what's proper to them. Um, if Stabilitas Loci were, were thrown out the window, there goes Benedictinism. If, uh, you know, if, if, if the fourth vow were thrown out of the Jesuits, there go the Jesuits, um, and so forth. But, <laughs> yes. yeah, the yes. Jesuits went a long time ago, we know. But, but the Jesuits are having serious problems anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Vows or no vows. Yeah, I mean, yeah, but but these are things that I'm just I just picked that randomly something that was yes. integral to each. But yes. if you but it, but the same thing is true of these liturgies. And yeah, there there's been sort of cross pollination over the years. But when you say, well, they do it in the Byzantine rite, so we can do it, that doesn't wash because you've yeah, got it doesn't t- wash. And what it what it leads to then is it often leads to a forgetfulness and even a contempt for what is distinctively Western. Yeah. Um, and you, you get this occasionally, especially you find it among professional liturgists, um, what one of one of one of the most um, useless class of, of people on the <laughs> earth. And, I, and I'm not one, so I can say that. Um, but but uh, you, you often find this kind of Byzantif- Byzantophilic mentality by which I mean, you know, oh, everything the East does is so wonderful. Well, of course, when they br- when they try to bring it into the West, they never actually retain the lofty spirituality and the you know the profound reverence that characterizes the eastern things they just sort of cherry pick what they want and then they distort it you know and make, yeah. but let me give you an example you know there was this fashion or fad in the 1960s based on shoddy scholarship that you know oh the 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 western liturgical rites they they lack an epiclesis they lack an invocation of the holy spirit you've written yeah. about this you know yes. um and and you know they they lack this thing that all the Byzant- all the Eastern liturgies have the invocation of the Holy Spirit to uh, to transubstantiate the gifts. So there must be a defect in the in the the Latin rite uh, or the various Western rites. You know, so we're going to just cram in an epiclesis, even though it's never existed there, or maybe it hypothetically did, but it dropped out according to this, some of the scholars. Well, what what they what that ends up doing is it it blocks the effort to understand with a humble theological mind why there might be a Eucharistic prayer that doesn't have an epiclesis. Yeah. Maybe there's a different theology going on here. Maybe there's a different spirituality. And in fact, that is the case when you look into it. Yeah. The, the, in the Eastern world, they had fights over the divinity of the Holy Spirit, yeah, the, the, called Macedonianism. Yeah. And, and Pneuma, so they had Pneumatomachianism, cons- right? So it's, it's yeah. The fighters against the Spirit. That's why they right. inserted the epiclesis in the Precisely. Eastern Precisely. But in the West, we didn't have that battle. Yeah. That's right. And the Roman canon instead um, has a, a theology of you know the invoking the Father, uh, who is well pleased in the Son, to do whatever we ask in the name of His Son, and and because His Son, um, who's all pleasing to Him, says this is my body and this is my blood, that's enough for the omnipotence of of the Father to transubstantiate the gifts. So it's it's a different way of thinking about it. It's equally true. It's equally beautiful, you know, as, as the Eastern way, but we shouldn't. We shouldn't just artificially cram these things together. It doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. Well, the the the, the slapdash approach to liturgy is uh, <laughs> is ruinous, as we all know uh, from from sad experience. So the three elements to the to the sonic iconostasis, just to sort of recapitulate that, are the Gregorian chant, the Latin language first, uh, the the Gregorian chant, and then the silence. Um, and and you point out in this book, but also you go into more depth elsewhere about how the silence in the Roman rite, through the traditional Roman rite, isn't a kind of artificial silence, as if to say, okay, now we're going to spend a few moments of silence now, and mm-hmm. you interrupt the ceremony with the silence. No, the silence is something that goes right through the ceremony and the most sacred part of the mass when when the most right. important actions happening there's that yes. sort of that sonic hole there through which the mystery uh, occurs yes exactly it's it's the the silence is organic 
because it accompanies actions that are taking place in silence. Um, so it's not just people sitting around waiting for the next thing to happen. Yeah. You know, something is happening. Um, and I, I talk about that also in this chapter too, the, the qualities of what I call density, complexity, and simultaneity. So again, these are just, you know, easy, easy ways to summarize rather large and subtle things. But, um, but by density, I mean, there is, there's a lot going on in the traditional Latin liturgy, especially in a solemn high mass or a pontifical mass. There's a lot going on simultaneously, um, and but done by many different people and different people praying or singing different things, right? And it's much more like the way the cosmos actually works, you know, with angels who are ministering spirits here and there and human beings doing their own thing and men and women, clergy, laity, bishops. You know, it's we live in a complex hierarchical world, right? And the old liturgy reflects that. It, it really captures something of that, that complexity and density, but it's not it's not, again, something forbidding or something exclusive. What it rather does is it draws you in kind of gently and almost imperceptibly into prayer because it's like everybody's praying around me. You know, they're all doing different things. I guess I'm just going to pray too. Right? So it, yeah. <laughs> it, has this, it has this odd way of not putting you on the spot, but actually freeing you up to just be in the presence of God and to pray in the way that, that suits you best. For some people, and I talk about this too, especially in chapter three, which is on active participation. You know, for some people that means following every prayer in the Missal. And I do that sometimes, even today, even though I know these prayers very well. Sometimes I like to put my eyes on them. You know, maybe I'm feeling tired or or I just want to have that visual reinforcement um, for my mind. But then there are other, t- you know, other times for me or other people, you know, they don't have the Missal. They just want to, they just want to sit there and kneel and walk watch the movements and listen to the prayers or the gesture or, or the chants, watch the incense, you know, wafting through the air. I mean, you know, and then there are other people who might use devotional books or pray a rosary or whatever they're doing, they're, they're, each person is gently drawn into this great motion of praise and adoration and thanksgiving that there's nothing regimented or forced or sort of populistic about it where it's like it's focused on you and you've got to perform you've got to do this thing no it's it's everybody's doing his own thing in a hierarchical and orderly way and we get to participate in that it's very liberating i find it very liberating you're listening to reconquest in the crusade premium channel part of the veritas radio network this is brother andre marie i am interviewing dr peter kwasniewski on the subject, The Genius and Timeliness of the Traditional Latin Mass, we're discussing a book that he's recently published uh, with that as a subtitle. The title is Reclaiming Our Roman Catholic Birthright, published by Angelico Press. Now, the, um, so the, you, you do speak later in the, in the book about, in Chapter 3, about the uh, actual participation, which I, I want to ask you about in a, in, in a minute. But in Chapter 2, you do talk about this unjust Protestant attack on the Mass being something reserved for a certain clerical caste, that, that, that it's, a, it's, it's something for the clerical caste and the lay people are sort of distant, uh, and you point out that this is really an attack on medieval piety. And I think you 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 kind of, in a footnote you kind of let um, oh what's the gentleman's name the English uh, author kind of do a lot of the a lot of the the the, the work for you because he wrote the book um, the stripping of the altars uh, Eamon Duffy is that it oh uh, yes, oh, yes that's, he, that's right yes so traditional uh, piety in, in in England in the in the Middle Ages I guess is the subtitle of that book but uh, but but this idea that 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 the lay people were just sort of um, distant spectators at a, a, a at the activity of a clerical caste that happened, and and it should be pointed out that in, in the Middle Ages, still, in many of the Latin rites, uh, there were similar visual um, ob- object obstacles in the way of the people seeing into the sanctuary. There were curtains, so exactly. we didn't have an iconostasis, but like in England, they had, of course, the rude screens, uh, which are beautiful. Um, it's a beautiful feature, but it doesn't allow the faithful to look in. But still, there was, an, uh, there was a serious participation on the part of the faithful, and that that unfortunate attack on, on medieval piety that we get in the Protestant revolt has seeped into the Catholic Church, and uh, so that oh well, the mass isn't just a clerical thing; it's also everybody. So they've 
clericalized the lay people and they've laicized the clerics all at yes. the same time. They put us all into a blender. Yeah, yeah it's true. Well, th this is a you know this is one of those subtle questions that I've really you know worked I've worked hard over the years to try to figure out the best way to talk about just this point of what is it about the traditional Latin mass that even though the priest has so much more to do and the laity seem to have a lot less to do, what is it about the way that things are set up that actually empowers, enables the laity to enter so much more deeply into the mystery of the mass? Um, and I, I think, I mean, I think that I've gotten a lot of purchase on that question over the years. It seems to me to have a lot to do with the clarity with which the the mass unfolds in its in all of its parts and all of the meaning of those parts in such a way that that the the layman in the pews can can more easily identify himself with these different actions and motions and the meaning of them in the mass that, that is there's something more contemplative about it at least for the lay people i know it's true for the priests too although they have a you know a hard job they have a lot of work to do uh, all the not just the priests but all the all the ministers you know the deacon the subdeacon the 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 acolytes whatever but the the there's a, something contemplative and meditative about the mass and because what you're contemplating is so rich really inexhaustibly rich whether you're looking at how it, you know, the external appearances or whether you're looking at the actual content of the prayers, um, it, it actually just, it, it sucks you in, in a very profound way. Um, whereas the, the, the new rite, um, unfortunately, I mean, it's, 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 I, I don't think, I've still never found an actual heresy in the Novus Ordo, but there's something kind of superficial in the literal sense of the word about how it's conducted, how it, how it's laid out. It, it's like, it kind of it's like it sort of skims the surface the whole time and because there's always something being said aloud and you're doing something or something's being done towards you towards the people that is in an anthropocentric way um and just because of a lot of bad habits that have cropped up you know with the full permission and even encouragement of the church um you know it ends up being really a a a, a self celebration of the community as mm -hmm. Joseph Ratzinger talks about on, on a number of occasions. It, it's something, it's the community expressing its own faith. So it's it's like a collective, a kind of high-level collective self-help religious um, ritual of this, you know, this is who we are, this is what we believe. Okay, well, there's nothing per se wrong with that, but that isn't what the Mass is. You know, that, yeah, yeah, that yeah, yeah. The, the church has a kind of, um, liturgical ecosystem, for lack of a better term. Let's just be environmental you know, <laughs> about this. And the, the church has a liturgical and sacramental ecosystem where every species in that ecosystem has to do what it's supposed to do inside the, the environment, inside the ecosystem. And if you kill a bunch of these species, then all the other, you know, everything else is going to get thrown out of whack. And that's what's happened, I would say, one of the things that's happened with the mass is that the mass has been turned into the be all and end all the only thing that catholics do ever together you know if they're going to have a parish picnic oh we got to start with the mass you know under the the tent and you know it's and next to the hot dogs and hamburgers you know it's it, it's the only it's almost like catholics can't think of anything else to do together except that and that's mm -hmm. a problem because we have the divine office to pray together we have we could have a scripture study group together which would be a great a, a better way to get to know scripture than reading this unwieldy gigantic two three year lectionary you know we could actually we could we could go to confession and make make a serious use of that you know we could pray the rosary and meditate on the mysteries so there's this you know what i'm saying there's this complex yeah. ecosystem of ways that we're supposed to relate to each other and to god and the mass is a very i would describe the mass as being like the peak the summit of a mountain where it's 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 lofty it's a lofty peak the air is a bit thin it's a, it's a bit chilly up there but you can see you know for miles in every direction it's the most magnificent view but it's a narrow peak you know that's built on the rest of our devotional and sacramental life right? yeah elsewhere elsewhere in the book you refer to it as steep craggy and sublime i wrote that down yeah. i thought that was, <laughs> this is in your answer to father longernecker uh, yeah so so that's my my thought is that if people can 
can learn, and I think the traditional mass teaches us this without even very much difficulty. We don't even have to try hard if we just are patient with it and let it form us. Let be passive to it. Passivity is not a is, receptivity is not a bad thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, but if if we let it form us, we'll come to appreciate the mass as like it's like a laser beam of a prayer. You know, it's not supposed to be this kind of watercolor wash that that is somehow everything and nothing you know it's it's very specific and it should do exactly what it's supposed to do and when it does that well it opens up worlds worlds and worlds um spiritually speaking You're- so it's like entering it's like entering through the narrow door yeah and then when once you enter through that narrow door you're in this this lush garden, right, that spreads out in all different directions. But you had to get there through the narrow door. Yeah, well, you, you, you're talking about that. You, you you made a, 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 a an eco uh, a, an ecological comparison for the mass. Uh, we're getting into a little bit of an agricultural thing here at St. Dominic <laughs> Center for for necessary reasons. But uh, as we do so, we're 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 applying some of the principles of what's called permaculture. And permaculture yes. is sort of getting away from the monoculture way that they do farming now. Sort of the Monsanto approach. You just drench this field in chemicals and then grow one crop on it and ruin the soil and all that stuff. Whereas there's a much richer approach to the whole permaculture thing where you're using nature's natural symbioses uh, where different plants and animals sort of help each other out. Well, it's mm-hmm. interesting because when you, as soon as you brought up the ecological comparison, I thought of some things that you said in the book about the different ways of participating in the mass. And, mm-hmm. I, and I also I thought back uh, to horrible days when I was in school, in a Catholic school, and when our religion teacher, an, a, a former nun, was basically screaming at us all to participate by singing these garbage glory and praise tunes and Mm -hmm. none of which enthused us at all Um, Mm -hmm. and uh, the idea is that everybody had to do the same dang thing yeah, everybody was expected to do. You, you, you were, you were all part of this thing, and the actual or active participation was. We had to sing these garbage songs. The idea that you could be at that nobody would have thought that you could kneel silently and benefit from what's going on at the altar. What yes. the priest did and the way he went about it didn't look like the kind of thing yeah. that you could kneel in silence and benefit from. He yes. didn't convey you're talking that. About in the, you're talking about in the Novus Ordo. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. No, it's terrible. You can't do that. I mean, you, you can't you can't kneel and silently contemplate what goes on at a lot of, of English masses. I mean, it would be, it's just not something you can meditate with. Well, yeah, let me just make a point based on what you were saying. Um, well, I've... <sighs> If you're going to, okay, the spiritual life, the interior life is difficult. I mean, it's not difficult in the sense that it's only for a privileged few. It's for everyone. And God God offers everyone the grace to develop a life of charity and a life of prayer. But it's still difficult for us, for our fallen, sensual human nature with disordered concupiscence, with distractions from work, from family life, you know, from from the world, from politics, from COVID nineteen, whatever it is, <laughs> yeah. it's it's difficult to concentrate. It's difficult to recollect ourselves, to gather ourselves in to the interior castle and actually come, you know, into communion with with the divine, with the the Holy Trinity. That's very difficult for us to do, and so one of the one of the great helps that the church traditionally gave us is a liturgy that was very sort of unbending and in a certain sense unyielding it was it was almost always the same obviously there were all kinds of beautiful subtle differences from week to week or from season to season but fundamentally the traditional Latin mass it's like it's monolithic in a certain sense it's this it's this beautifully polished organically developed structure of prayer that that is totally solid and reliable. It's like a structure you can climb on and you can beat it up and it'll never break. It's You can do anything <laughs> to it. It's unbreakable, right? And so it can sustain you in your prayer and it teaches you how to pray. And it, it teaches you how to pray with the patience of a teacher who never gets upset with you and who never, and who doesn't like fly off the handle and change her method every other week or whatever. It, it's the method is always the same. So what I find is that like all, I, I went. I've been going to, to the traditional mass for many years, and there were things about it that didn't make sense to me. But one day, after months or years or something, something would click, and suddenly, like a window or a door would open, and I would say, "Oh, that's it! I just saw something about God or about myself 
uh, or about some other mystery that I've never seen before. But I was able to do that because I'd been confronted with it so many times. Yes, yes. <laughs> and, and, and it's like my soul was finally able to catch up with the thing that was always there and had been there for, you know, a thousand years or two thousand years or something of church history. And so – there, there's something very stable, like like a, it's a it's a very solid wooden ladder, you know, on which you can climb. And for up, all and for all of up. its stability, it doesn't cram you into a, a uniformity with everybody else around you. Hence, no, you can. Hence, exactly, the, can, hence the diverse can, ecosystem. Right, and so you can. It's so it, there's a paradox here, and there always is. When when you start talking about you know the traditional liturgy, you find all kinds of paradoxes, which are wonderful. But the paradox is that. The liturgy, the old liturgy, is so um, so much, so firmly and stably and solidly what it is, that it facilitates many, many different ways of entering into it. It's not a one size fits all um, enterprise. Yeah. So that so that the actual participation, uh, participatio actuosa, that was mentioned by Pope Saint Pius X, uh, November twenty second, Feast of Saint Cecilia, nineteen o three. Uh, a work he wrote in Italian, Tra le Solicitudini, where he talks about uh, participatio actuosa, which is mistranslated into active participation. Um, so this is a problem. I knew a priest who was our chaplain for years who said, who pointed out to me that that was mistranslated. It's not active participation. It's actual participation. And you point out in your book that by it he meant entering into the to, to the divine worship that's taking place on the altar. It it had nothing. He wasn't saying you have to be part of some dialogue with the priest or you mm-hmm. you have to sing or you have to um, worship by saying the response like the altar boy does he was he was talking about with the mind and the soul and the heart entering into the mystery of divine worship taking place on the altar uh, so right. you go into this at great at great length in the book but you also point out yeah there there are so many different and divergent ways of participating but that it's not you know, one of the attacks on the traditional mass is, well, the traditional mass is something that happens over there. You know, here are the lay people over here, and the mass is something that happens over there. And again, it goes to that idea of uh, it's a spectator thing, and you're a distant spectator. But uh, you point out, I think very eloquently, that that's not the case. And, and I should yes. say that in your apologetics, I mean, if somebody says, well, I don't need to read that, I'm already convinced. It's not a matter of just the apologetics for somebody who's unconvinced. It's also that it it will help you you, as it helped me in reading these passages, to grow in a deeper appreciation of what we have, of the treasures that we actually have. But uh, so somebody can partic- can actually participate in a variety of ways in the traditional mass, but it, it begins with what makes us uh, human, you know, intellect yes. and will. It engages right. the intellect and the will. And there's this point, I, you know, you, you're, you're kind of bringing up a point from chapter three um, about the distance. There is a real... There's a deliberate cultivation of distance in the traditional liturgy between the congregation in the nave and the the clergy in the sanctuary. But it's not for the sake of leaving them distant, right, of saying goodbye, you know, like sending them into outer space, you know, the, because they, they're not relevant. It's it's essential for creating the the atmosphere of the sacred and of mystery. That is, if we just if we just saunter right into a church – and we just go right up around the altar and hold hands and say the Our Father and pass around the cup and all this kind of stuff that was happening in the 70s and still in some places happens, although not very often anymore. Um, if we do all of that, whatever else is going on, it's not mysterious, it's not sacred, it's not divine, it's not transcendent, it's not, you know, it's not what Christians have always held the the liturgical mysteries to be about. Um, so the, the Mass actually has a kind of wise pedagogy for leading us into the presence of God in such a way that we understand him to be deserving of reverence and fear, but also then to be in a position where we can actually cry out to him and ask for his help because we know we need it. You know, we have to be reminded of, of who and what we are first and in order to overcome the gap. In order, over, So basically what I'm saying is, if people don't know that there's distance between us and God, they're never going to turn to him in, in contrition and in petition and ask for the grace to be united to him, right? If yeah, you, yeah. It's like if you don't even know that God exists 
then then what's you know what kind of faith life can you have? And similarly, if you don't have a, a proper conception of 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 the awe, the awe that one should have in the presence of God, then the rest of religion is vain at that point because you're not dealing anymore with the true God. You're dealing with some kind of like teddy bear God or some yeah, yeah. some kind of fiction of the human mind, right? That we make up. So the traditional liturgy, it separates and it distances in order to unite and to connect and to awaken. And this is so important how so it does. Two, two sort of pat phrases come to mind, which none of which are, well, I guess they, they apply, but you have to kind of bend them a little bit. Absence makes the heart grow fonder, and that gets into the distance <laughs> thing. But also, uh, familiarity breeds contempt. Yes. And I think that second one actually has a greater application here because, uh, you know, the, the communion in the hand and so forth, we know that, that there was a, somebody could say it's po, uh, post hoc ergo propter hoc, but we know that there was a drop off in Eucharistic faith after the introduction of communion in the hand. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, There's no doubt about that. And, yeah. I, and, I, and I don't think it is post hoc ergo propter hoc. I think there's a direct yeah. causal relationship there. Uh, so that, that distance is something that's not impassable. That's the thing. It's the, it's, it's the, there's, the, there's the distance that's created. But in order that we might reach out uh, yes. and reach up, you know, so, so <laughs> there's a, there's a dim- exactly. dimension of verticality there going yes. so up to God. It's very much about self-knowledge. And the, the other thing I would mention, too, that hasn't come up yet is – you know, the old liturgy has a very rich liturgical calendar, especially a cal- the calendar of the saints. And the saints are the saints are so important in Catholicism because they come from our own ranks. They're our fellow brothers and sisters in the human race, but they are also holy, and they are they have merit, and they they, they intercede for us, and we look up to them as models. Right? They they have run the race. They fought the fight. Um, and they have triumphed gloriously. So the saints are a, a hugely important link between us and God. Not that we don't have an immediate relationship with God, but God loves secondary causes, and he loves to multiply intercessors and people to love, you know, just like God loves babies and he loves big families, right? The yeah. church is a big family. He loves all the saints and he wants the saints to be powerful for our sake, but also to be near us, you know, the way that, that our Blessed Mother is so near to us. And the, the old liturgy has a way of very strongly emphasizing the mediation and the, and the aid that's offered to us by the saints. You see that in the Confitior and in the Roman canon and in the calendar, which has 300 more saints, if you can believe that. That's, that's actually the case. The old general Roman calendar that's used in the traditional mass has 300 more saints commemorated wow. than the Novus Ordo calendar does. Now, it's true that part, part of those numbers, there are a couple of really big chunks. There. Like, there's a group of 40 martyrs, the 40 crowned martyrs. Okay, yes. It just got chucked out of the Novus Ordo. So in terms of like individual named um, saints, you're probably looking more at 200 that were axed. But if you add in, you know, the 40 crowned martyrs, which were always part of the Roman liturgy and just got chucked out in 1969, you know, that's where I'm getting up to my number 300. <laughs> but, okay. but it's 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 an astonishing thing that the Novus Ordo emptied out um, so many of these, I don't know how to put it, handles by which we come into contact with God and by which he helps us um, it's like it, it's a more naked ritual. It's like it throws us right there in the in the cold spotlight and says, like, perform in front of God instead of saying, no, it's OK for you to hide a bit in the shadows and to and to call out to the saints and to and to beg their intercession to help you to be worthy to approach God. This is not medieval piety. This is reality, folks. This is the way things are. Very good. Yeah, it's reality because we are the communion of saints, and we have this. We 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 rely on the prayers of the saints. Exactly. Uh, so, and so the so the old calendar has it's much richer. It has more feasts and more fasting, and it has more differentiated seasons. And the reason this is all important is there's actually more for us for our imagination and for our memory and for our senses in the old liturgy um, and the, and it spills over more easily into day-to-day family life you know if you get a traditional calendar there's more to celebrate there there's you know there are transitional periods like septuagesima anyway i could go on and on but yeah. my my point is that that what a lot of catholics need to realize or or what i'm hoping so much to help them to realize is 
the traditional Latin Mass is not like some kind of elitist operation where it's like, well, you get to be part of this special club now and you no. can pat yourself on the back. No, it's not that at all. It's it's we are sinners. We're, you know, strangers and sojourners, and we need all the help we can get to sanctify ourselves and to reach heaven. And the tradition of the Catholic Church is is chock full of all these different ways of doing that that were developed over many centuries, and so many of them were just brutally thrown out in the 1960s and 70s. And the, right? the, the beauty of the calendar and the customs that were attached to the calendar uh, would spare us all the effort of coming up with new programs to make people exactly. learn their faith and appreciate their faith and live their faith uh, instead of some bureau bureaucratic solution that makes um, some publishing house lots of money publishing some stupid <laughs> book that everybody's <laughs> going to forget in five years. Uh, exactly. You can do the same thing over and over again and love it like all of the cool customs that we get whether, whether it be Ember Days or, or or exactly. the certain rogations, uh, rogation yeah. days, certain observances of saints' days. So right, we, we, yeah, exactly. So <laughs> we, we have about uh, we have we have less than five minutes, doctor. But I want to I want to turn to the children before we yes. before we go. Yes. You have a lot of stuff in the book about children um, and about you know how, helping them to serve at the mass, helping them rather to to assist at the mass. Um, what what would you like to say about? The the, uh, the the future of the church, you know, forming the future of the church by yes. teaching children. Yeah, so right, so you're right. I have four chapters in this book, a pretty substantial section about how important it is for children to be exposed to the traditional Latin Mass, to be immersed in it, how important it is for the transmission of the faith from grandparents to parents to children and to grandchildren, right? If we want to pass on the faith, we need the traditional Latin Mass. And everything that goes along with it. Um, so I talk about, like I talk about liturgy as the ultimate catechizer, right? It doesn't matter how much you catechize children, they will not get the point if they don't see the truth of the catechism reflected in the liturgy, okay? This is like the real presence will mean nothing to them if they don't see the priest and the servers frequently bowing profoundly before the Eucharist and incensing it. And, you know, all the, all the things that the traditional Mass does which some of which can be done in the Novus Ordo, but some of which can't be done if you actually study the rubrics, right? Um, so, you know, liturgy is the ultimate catechizer, and children are more receptive to what they see, and they have fewer filters than adults do. So an adult can be like kind of hardened, battle-hardened, right? Oh, I've been to so many Novus Ordos, I've seen it all. And, and maybe that, that adult can see, you know, you, extraordinary ministers of communion and they're not going to think twice about it or they're going to block it out or close their eyes and pray the rosary or something like that. But little children, they just soak it all in. Their eyes are open, their ears mm -hmm. are open, and they're being formed by all of their sensory experiences much more profoundly than 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 is the case as we get older and older. And so if you don't want children to have little doses of error and, and, and of, of poison, basically little doses of poison from the liturgy, it's important to go to a liturgy where everything is going to be done reverently and beautifully and, you know, with great care and with great love and with great adoration. That's And that's that's the kind of thing that is going to form children, not just in a sort of cerebral, cerebral way, but in an emotional, imaginative, right, just a, a, a whole human person way. If we want somebody to be Catholic, you know, to the tips of their toes and their fingers and in the depths of their soul – then we need to expose them to Catholic tradition, and so I talk about that from a lot of different angles. And you also have a, a, a practical, some practical suggestions in the book uh, how to help, how practically to help children enter into the mass. Yes, um, that's right. I talk about things that parents can do at home with the children to prepare them. Um, you know, and, and then I talk about things to do at Mass to help them. I, I have in a bibliography. I recommend different missiles for children at different levels, and you know, so it's it's not. A full-scale practical approach, but there's a lot of practical advice built in as well. Yeah, because of course people are going to think, well, the the, the Novus Ordo is going to be more accessible to a child. Yeah, but it's not. It's if, not. It's, it's not <laughs> because because accessible children quickly get bored with verbiage. With a bunch of adults, a bunch of talking heads going on and on and on is very boring to them. But if they can go in and see some kind of majestic procession with the thoroughfare and clouds of incense floating and the chant soaring and the priest is bowing at the altar and, you know, 
and they see everybody else taking it seriously too. This is way is going to have way bigger an impact on a child. It is is going to tell him something serious is going on here, you know, yeah. <laughs> and something real. And I better behave for this, you know. So that's why I talk in this book about how many parents are surprised to find that their children um, behave better at the traditional Latin mass than they do at the Novus Ordo. Because the Novus Ordo, there's kind of the subliminal message, like, let it all hang out. You know, do, why should I control myself? I mean, it's not really, you know, very, it's not a special atmosphere in here. But if you go to a traditional Latin mass, you know, and sometimes you can hear a pin drop, right? That's that's when, it's, you know, children, have, obviously, little tiny kids sometimes are going to misbehave. You have to take them out, whatever. Every, every parent knows that. But as kids get older, they absorb that, that atmosphere and that spirit, and they begin to kneel up and pay attention attention and they want to find out what's the priest saying and oh show me how to use the missile right and they end up knowing their faith better and praying better because of it the cat the catholic film critic roger ebert who he grew up catholic he fell away because of two two men he said hugh hefner and charles darwin but uh but ebert said that his protestant friends grew up uh sensorily deprived they grew up with sensory deprivation and he grew up of course ebert was old enough to have grown up in the days of the traditional mass and that was the norm so i think you know children get engaged with that sense all that sensory stuff that you're talking about, the smells, bells, and yells that go along with the traditional yes. literature. <laughs> so, uh, yes. well, unfortunately, Doctor, we've run out of time, but I, I need to thank you most profusely for taking the time and giving us your wisdom uh, on this most important subject. And, and, and I suggest that young parents especially buy the book so that you can get some of these ideas of how to pass on the tradition to the children, because that's a lot of it. A lot of the battle war begins. Thank you so much, Doctor. God bless you. You're welcome. God bless. All right. And you've been listening to Reconquest on the Crusade Premium Channel. God bless and Merry Keeper.